Welcome, members and guests. Uh, today is Wednesday, February 23rd, 2022. I hereby call the Subcommittee on Elections and Con Campaign Finance to order. Uh, Madam Secretary, roll call, please. Representative Holsclaw. Here. Representative Love. Representative Manis. Here. Representative Shaw. Here. Representative Williams. Representative Wright. Here. Chairman Crawford. Present. Chairman Rudd. Here. Chairman Rudd, you have a quorum. Thank you. Um, introductions, personal orders, announcements from uh, members? Seeing none, uh, we will progress with our bills. We um, had 14 bills today. The following bills um, have been uh, rolled or other action taken. Uh, item number seven, HB 2331 by Brecken is rolled one week. Um, item number eight, HB 2642 by Powell has been taken off notice. Um, uh, item number 11, HB 1634 by Griffey has been rolled one week. Um, item number 12, HB 2305 by Griffey has been rolled one week. And uh, excuse me, uh, also item number four, HB 2067 by Hosey has been rolled one week. And we will now progress on to item number one, HB 2483 by Chairman Zachary. Motion. Second. I have a motion and a second. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Committee. Uh, Mr. Please. Chairman, I have an amendment with drafting code 14013. That's what we have. Do I hear a motion on the amendment and second? I hear a motion and a second on the amendment. Do I hear any discussion on the amendment or do you want to adapt the amendment first? Seeing no objections, let's uh, voting to adapt the amendment. Uh, 14013, all those in favor say aye. aye. Opposed nay. Amendment is adapted. Um, uh, Mr. Zachary, if you will tell us your amended bill. Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and committee. Uh, members, uh, the Tennessee General Assembly and Secretary Hart have done an incredible job with the elections in the state of Tennessee. Every year that I've been here in the four terms I've been here, we typically will take a step each year related to election integrity and ensuring that we have the best elections possible. I think the results speak for themselves. Elections end at eight o'clock Eastern in this state. We typically turn the lights out and go home by nine o'clock Eastern. We do an extremely efficient job in this state. Uh, we were recently ranked number three uh, by a think tank in terms of election integrity of all the states in the nation. Uh, so that's significant, but there's always room for improvement. So uh, Mr. Chairman and committee, that's what this bill does, addresses an area where we can look at and improve slightly. This piece of legislation uh, guarantees the Article 1, Section 4, Article 2, Section 1 responsibility of the legislature related to elections. Uh, this Constitution is clear that we set the time, place, and manner and in terms of the electors. That's up to the legislature. That is not the role of the Secretary of State, County Commission, Election Boards, whomever it may be. So this particular piece of legislation simply says that no county official or state official, and those are described in detail in the bill, may enter a consent decree without uh, the consultation of our House Speaker or our Lieutenant Governor. And it provides a cause of action for the legislature for any violation of that. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I, oh, and I also, um, I have tried to distribute uh, to everyone a letter in support of this from Secretary Hargett. With that, I'll be glad to answer your questions. Have any questions? Seeing no questions, we have a motion to move. Question, uh, no objections. All those in favor of HB 2483, say aye. aye. Opposed, nay. Bill passes on to full local. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and committee. Next up is item number two by uh, Representative Chris Todd, item number HB 2203. You're presenting from the table. And I believe we have an amendment uh, that makes the bill. Um, is that drafting code 13932? Yes, sir, it is. I hear a motion and a second on the amendment. Motion, motion second. I have, a mo I have an amendment on the amendment. I have a motion and second. Any discussion on the amendment? Seeing none, we're voting to uh, adapt the amendment. Uh, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, nay. Amendment is on the bill. Please tell us about your amended bill. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and the amendment does make the bill. This prohibits a foreign national, foreign corporation, foreign charitable or nonprofit organization, foreign government en governmental entity or body, governmental agency, governmental body from providing financial support for certain initiatives and referendums 
and through social media advertisement intended to disseminate information in uh, this, usually these are local referendums and we've had some instances across the country where some uh, foreign companies uh, have tried to intervene financially and sway the vote on a referendum, a local decision making process. Uh, I think it's, uh, I believe it's already illegal for them to, to be involved in elections, but uh, they, uh, a court ruling said that that did not apply to a referendum. So this is what this uh, extends to. I have a uh, request, uh, Representative Shaw. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. First thing I wanted to find out, why is all of our participants in wheelchairs today? They think they're going to get their uh, <laughs> legislation passed because they come in here in wheelchairs. But, but uh, no, so, seriously, I'm, <laughs> uh, I did want to ask, and I understand what you're doing. I, I get it, and, and uh, I get it well. But how do you think you can... I guess, for lack of a better word, uh, keep this under control. How do you think, if that's if that's fair statement, in terms of stopping it? Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, just like any other law that we pass, uh, it's going to have to be enforced. Uh, I, well, I guess I'm asking who is going to enforce it and how. Not that I'm against your legislation. I'm just trying to figure out how we're going to do this with the overload that we got already with law enforcement taking care of things. How do you think we're going to be able to do that? I don't know exactly the mechanism that we have uh, right now for enforcing, but this would at least set it up to where uh, if, if someone brought, if someone in the public brought those charges, there could be a private action, I would think. Um, this particular court case that, uh, that I'd read about, uh, the Federal Election Commission, I think, handles complaints like that. And so the court ruled that the FEC did not have jurisdiction over this because basically, technically, it was not an election for individuals. So I think the Federal Election Commission would probably enforce this. And uh, if we pass this, then uh, the courts would uphold that. Thank you, sir. Um, uh, Chairman Williams. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, Representative Todd, just uh, so good to be close to someone we <laughs> presenting. <laughs> the, uh, the bill only applies to referendums. Is there any protections for this for any other part of the ballot as it relates to foreign nationals I thought I heard you say it only applied to referendum or is it to any election state statewide it's a local initiative a referendum unofficial public opinion poll on a governmental bill or initiative or other matters for which an electorate cast a vote or indicates a preference that does not involve the election of an individual to public office There's a lot there, I know. Yeah. But that's that's pretty much everything that doesn't affect an a, a individual being elected to public office. Okay. How would this apply to if... A um, excuse one moment. I've got to present a bill in the um, hand in the committee over to um, Chairman Crawford. You're recognized. How would this apply to dollars invested in social media advertisements? I mean... If you were a foreign national entity and you wanted to opine, you could easily do it through Facebook ads or Twitter ads. Does this prevent that? I believe it does, uh, just like I believe any foreign entity now would be in violation if they supported, financially supported a social media advertising campaign against a candidate. So this extends it to these referendums and local initiatives as well. Okay. Representative Williams. Uh, as it relates to uh, the definition of foreign country, <clears throat> would you say that includes Illinois and California? <laughs> I would probably have to agree with that. But. Okay. Follow up, Chairman. Any other questions for the sponsor? Representative Shaw, you're recognized. It's to my colleague. I thought it was pretty cold over there. That's all. 
out of order. Um, any other questions for the sponsor? Any objection to the question? Seeing none, we're ready to vote. We're voting on House Bill 2203 as amended. All in favor, please say aye. aye. Those opposed, no. Bill moves on to local government full, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Item number three on today's agenda is House Bill 1970 by our Representative Eldridge. Looks like we've got uh, Chairman, you're going to present for... Well, actually, it's my bill. I'm okay. Sure where Representative, uh, Representative Eldridge signed on to it. It's such a good bill. Oh, yeah. There you go. Uh, all right. I do see it has an amendment. Um, do you have the drafting code? I do. It's uh, drafting code 013793. That is correct. Do I have a motion on the amendment? Motion. Okay. Yeah. Got a proper motion and second on the amendment. You're recognized on the amendment, sir. Thank you, Chairman. And uh, the amendment just adds clerks to the uh, original bill that I'm fixing to propose. Any questions on the amendment for the sponsor? Seeing none, we're ready to vote on amendment 13793 going on the bill. Please say aye. aye. Those opposed, no. The amendment's on the bill. You're recognized on the bill as amended. Thank you, Chairman and Committee. As introduced, House Bill 1970 requires a candidate for county legislative body clerks, constables, trustees, registers, assessors of property, school board, or chief administrative officers of the highway department to be a qualified voter of the county and a resident of the county for one year. With that, Committee, I renew my motion. Representative Holtzclaw, you're recognized to speak to the sponsor. Thank you, Chairman. This wasn't a requirement on any of these positions before now? Representative Russell. It's not. It's just to clean up the law where the law currently says members shall reside within the qualified voters of the district they represent. So it's just put it in statute. Okay. Follow up, Chairman Holtzclaw. No, thank you. Any more questions for the sponsor? Any objection to the question? Seeing none, we're ready to vote on House Bill 1970 as amended. All in favor, please say aye. aye. Those opposed, no. Bill moves on to local government. Thank you. Motion. Item number five, we have House Bill 0689 by Representative Beck. Do I have a motion and second? Motion. Representative Beck, you, uh, I'll let the, I'm going to turn the gavel back over to the um, chairman and he can recognize you. Great. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Appreciate your patience while I get situated. Absolutely. Let's see. Item number five. You may go ahead and uh, let's see. Um, we have a motion second on the bill. Okay. No amendments, correct? That's correct. Your, I almost said your honor. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Chairman. <laughs> uh, Chairman, I want to take this off notice. Uh, there's a similar bill going through that I've signed on to, and instead of being repetitive in front of your committee, uh, if we'll take this number five off notice, please. Uh, with no objections, we will take up HB 0689 off notice. Seeing none, it is off notice. That brings us to item number six by Beck, HB 1283. I have a motion and a second. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and committee. This is a very simple, straightforward bill. Uh, as you know, uh, right now, uh, license um, for uh, schools where when you're enrolled, they give you a student ID are not valid for uh, voting in, in our elections. Uh, we feel that the, uh, or I feel, that if we allow uh, our college students to be able to use their college ID, we're going to get more participation from our college students. And, and looking at the committee, I can see at least five members who either have a large university in their district or have a, uh, a, a large university in their county. I, we want our college students to participate. We want, we're one of the lowest uh, tier states for, for participation, and we want to get that participation up by uh, casting 
uh, make casting a vote easier and allowing college students to use their ID uh, will help facilitate this. With that, Mr. Chairman, I stand ready to take questions. I believe we have a question from Chairman Williams. Thank you. Um, I could ask my, uh, I'm one of the five you described. I guess the question is, is uh, how can, can someone have a college ID and not have a, a Tennessee driver's license? Uh, Representative Beck. Th thank you, Mr. Chairman. They can, and, and, and they can because they may have been dropped off at school and don't even drive. Many of our millennials, and I guess we're, we're, we're to uh, Gen Z now, is that correct? Uh, a lot of them are not like when I was young, I couldn't wait to get my driver's license. A lot of them put off getting their driver's license. So this would give them an ID that they could, uh, when they register, that their ID is, is um, is, is taken and they have to show proper identification such as a birth certificate, uh, social security card. They don't have to show a driver's license. Uh, Chairman Williams. Are you aware of any laws uh, on the books for enforcement of anyone trying to duplicate or uh, make false college IDs? Uh, Representative Beck. I know if you do that for state, if you do that for your driver's license, you know, it's, it's a law. You've broken the law. I'm, I'm sorry, Chairman Williams. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not aware, but I am aware that you, you're, as members, our um, state IDs will, will be valid for us to vote. We don't have to show a driver's license. We just have to show our state ID, which is a, similar to what I'm asking for under uh, college students being able to vote. So you, you show your legislative ID when you vote? Yes. Interesting. You're the first. I didn't know, didn't know you could do that. That's it. Thank you. I believe, um, uh, if I'm not mistaken, does your bill also, it, it applies to both public and private colleges and universities, doesn't it? Yes. Representative yes, Mr. Chairman, it does. So we would be allowing pr uh, private IDs as well as state IDs? Because it would be a private university would not be a state ID. It would be a private ID. Representative Beck. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yes, it would be from um, a, a Vanderbilt or a Rhodes or one of the private schools. Uh, Representative Shaw. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, to sponsor, if, if this was amended to have a date of birth on it, would that help? I mean, I, I get the idea because if you got an ID, if I show you my ID and we stand in there and I look like my ID, that's pretty well who I am. I guess uh, I'm thinking in terms of the validate to make sure that that person is old enough uh, to vote. Uh, I'm just asking you, would that help your legislation? Representative Beck. I thank you, Mr. Chairman. I meant the will of the committee. If the committee would like to limit it to just state universities and make sure that the IDs have the have the birth date on them, mm -hmm. uh, I'm just trying to help young people to be able to vote. I think in the in the past uh, there's when there's been opposition either here or, or elsewhere in the assembly, the one thing that's always been considered somewhat dangerous is universities has both in-state, out-of-state, and foreign students there, and someone could slip through, and they would rather it just be an ID meant for Tennesseans. Uh, even our IDs, we're uh, qualified to vote, we're elected under certain restrictions, so our IDs are for Tennesseans. Um, so I think that's always been a fear. Um, you have any re No response? Okay. Any, any other questions? Seeing not, oh yes, Representative Beck. Uh, Mr. Chairman, could I roll this for one week to uh, bring an amendment? It's your bill if that's what you wish to do. Let's do um, that. I are there any objections? Seeing none, we'll roll um, HB 1283 one week. Great, thank you, Mr. Chairman and committee.
Next, uh, let's see, let me get to the next item. Uh, item number nine by Representative Lamar, uh, HB 1869. Motion. And she will be giving her uh, presentation from the, uh, the table. We have a um, first and a second. I hear a motion and a second. Please tell us about your bill. And I believe it, does that have an amendment? Yes. Um, what is the amendment number on that? Zero one three nine two seven. That's what I have. Um, all the, they are motion and a second on the amendment. Here, a motion, second on the amendment. All those in favor of adapting the amendment, say aye. aye. Opposed, nay. Amendment is on the bill. Please tell us about your amended 1869. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Chairman. Give me one second. Let me adjust the mic. Okay, thank you. Um, this bill is to allow our two colleges, the University of Memphis and University of Tennessee, Knoxville, to designate uh, three days of their choosing during the November elections, that is the state and federal general and the presidential primaries, which happen once every four years, um, as uh, in places where people can early vote on campus um, in efforts to really get the our um, younger generation more engaged in the political process in the most nonpartisan way possible. It is to allow them to engage in the voting process where they go to school at our institutions of higher learning. Um, I chose these two ca college campuses because they have the capacity and have agreed that they want to allow this type of programming on their campus. I have submitted to you all or emailed to you all letters of support from the Student Government Association of the University of Tennessee, Knoxville, the Student Government Association at the University of Memphis is supporting, and actually, even though we had to remove them because of lack of support from the school, the Student Government Association, the student body president at MTSU, also sent a letter of support for this particular legislation. I've also received a letter of support from Randy Boyd, president of the UT University of Tennessee, Knoxville, in support of this bill. This bill costs nothing. It's the fiscal note on it is not significant. It costs us nothing to pass this piece of legislation just to allow three days of early voting on the campuses of the University of Memphis and the University of Tennessee, Knoxville. And that, and it's only during the November election for three days. That's it, it's very simple. And it's a bigger lift uh, for the, uh, our largest base of eligible voters in the state of Tennessee to allow them just to take part in the voting process on campus for three days at no cost to the state. I think uh, we, had, uh, we had received the email from Randy. We received nothing from the president of, um, of Memphis and um, nothing from any election commissions. Um, let's see, uh, I think we have questions. Uh, uh, Chairman Crawford. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I just have one question. Does the University of Tennessee not offer early voting at the Baker Center already? Um, Representative Lamar. Thank you. Yes, that's the crazy. That's the great thing about this bill is that because the University of Tennessee Knoxville is already doing, they're happy to join to codify because they're already doing it in practice. And I think that can be a model of what the University of Memphis can do. And the University of Memphis representative is here. The president has approved it. The letter just haven't received it yet. But the University of Memphis on board as well. So that is a fact, and they can raise their hand just to say that. Chairman but, Crawford. Yes. I'm sorry. Did you finish? I was just going to reiter reiterate the fact that the University of Tennessee Knoxville is already doing it. Yes. Chairman Crawford. So to the sponsor, um, are you going to add three days of early voting or are you, those three days just going to be included in the already early voting that we do? Representative Lamar. This is the of the 14 days that we get of early voting then three, uh, the college campuses can host at three days of early voting on campus of those 14. So I'm not adding, like, we go from 14 to 17 days of early voting now. Chairman Crawford. 
Okay, that, that's what was confusing me because, I mean, if we're already doing early voting at the Baker Center, then why would we pass a bill that would require them to do voting somewhere else three days and have to meet all those standards? I don't see how they can do that and it not cost any money because you've got to have poll workers, you've got to have the machine set up, you've got to have bathrooms, you've got to have parking places. Uh, so I'm just a little concerned it doesn't add up to me. Thank you, Representative Lamar. Thank you for your concerns. So what this, they're already in compliance. So if you all pass this piece of legislation, they won't have to change anything they're already doing. They are already in practice doing what we're trying to do. University of Memphis would be the newest one to add to that. But we do have the support of the campus, which sits in my district as well. Uh, Representative Manis. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you for this legislation. It's, uh, it really does pertain to Knox County, and I've gone back and forth. I want to make sure that everybody has an opportunity to vote. But uh, I've spoken many times recently with the Knox County Election Commission, and I think what, in my first conversation is, they said, Eddie, we're already doing three days on campus. They have a problem with it being codified and mandated that they do it because if there's any issue, and, and let me give you an example. <clears throat> Where the campus is located now, there is a voting location within a mile of campus. There's a community, I think in probably Representative Wright's uh, district, the Gibbs community, uh, how, do you, how do you say you have a, one in, within a mile of the university? But the Gibbs community, people in the Gibbs community have to drive miles to be able to vote. So that's the heartburn that the Knox County Election Commission is having. They want to continue to do that, to try to offer it on campus, but they have a problem with it being codified and mandated that they do it. So that's the word from the Knox County Election Commission uh, to me over and over. So. Uh, Representative Lamar. Thank you so much for your comments. I would challenge you and say, well, what kind of statement does it send to the public if you don't do it? I mean, we are a body and we've been elected to create laws to instruct many of our local municipalities and agencies to do the right thing. The right thing is every day we see complaints about the younger generation doesn't vote. They don't do this, they don't do that. When they're in college, they don't have cars, they don't have all of these necessary means that adults have but they are of 18 and they would like to participate in a democratic process. And at our institution is higher learning where we're grooming our young people to be the next stewards of our community to do right and fully participate in society, then we must also, in addition to the lessons that we teach them, give them chances to exercise their constitutional right to vote where they spend all of their time and their college campus is their home. Most of them don't live in a neighborhood. They don't live you know, close to many of these voting locations. They don't have cars. You know, we can't necessarily ask them to walk a mile to go vote. Why not put it on campus and make it simple? You, they don't, may not want to codify, but we codify a lot of pieces of legislation every day here in session. And so let's apply that same logic to the people who are dependent on us to allow them to participate in the process that we have today. I mean, if you look at the numbers, they are the lowest voting turnout. And if you go talk to them the way that I talk to young people, they say they don't have no information. No one ever engages with them. No one gives them opportunities to participate in the political process. And I think that's why UTK is a model for all of us, because they have taken the initiative to do that. But they, and they're going to, I'm sure, under the leadership they have now, they will continue to do that. But we have the opportunity to ensure that other institutions who have the capacity, like UTK, and the University of Memphis, which sits in my district, and I have a Shelby County Election Commissioner here right now who is on board with this idea that we want to do that too. We're asking for two universities. One, that this won't change anything they're already doing it is going to qualify, and the other university sits in my district. It is one of the largest universities in the state that also wants to participate in this. All we're asking you is allow students to vote on campus for three days. That's it. And what you're going to do is set the tone for our next leaders, our next people in the job force to participate in the political process. Our voter turnout rates amongst the younger generation is so low, some of the lowest in the nation. We have an opportunity to change the trajectory today. 
in a way that's nonpartisan, that is fair, and it allows every person to exercise their right to vote, even those who want to vote for you. Chairman Williams. I, I can appreciate, thank you, Chairman. I, I can appreciate your passion uh, about this topic, but uh, we, we codify, usually codify things that we, that don't currently exist. Knox County is, through their election commission, has created a pathway wh where they have set up a, a standard where they can do that. Currently, anyone can do it. I think what uh, my good friend from Knox County is saying is they're wanting to do it. They just don't want to be required to do it based upon who the people are that are serving in their communities now, in particularly with the concerns of fraud and other things. My, my concern is if the member who represents that county on this subcommittee says that his community doesn't want it, then he has to support that. In my community, because your original bill had included the institution of higher learning in my community, I spoke with my institution and, the, and they do not have the ability to, to do this and collaborate in the same way that Knox County does with their local election, uh, uh, election commission. And so I understand what you're saying, but if, if Memphis wanted to do this, there's nothing to prevent them from doing it. There's not a law that says they can't. Representative Lamar. Thank you for your comments. Memphis does want to do it. The university wants to do it. The students want to do that. The election commissioner works on behalf of the people. And so if those 18 year olds on the 18 and up on those campuses want to vote, then the election commission needs to be answering to them. They shouldn't have the ability to say, well, I don't want to give you the opportunity to vote right here because I don't want to do this or I don't want to be mandated. If you have a, a large body of voters who are asking for you to bring opportunities to vote to their home place, why won't we do that? I think that the philosophy, we should require them to engage in a younger generation. We should allow them for the institutions that are going to allow them on campus to, to, to be able to give their students those opportunities because the election commission, they work for the people. Uh, Chairman Williams. Uh, has, has this large body of voters, have they gone to the election commission, the regular meeting and asked for this? To the, I, I'm not sure if they well, asked. I think you had an election commissioner here. Maybe they can testify as to whether or not this large track of Gen Z voters uh, have been to an actual meeting asked the county commission in Shelby County to vote on higher education campuses. Because the current law, the, the way the statute is, as long as they meet the guidelines, mm -hmm. they can set up a precinct there. I'd, li I'd like to know if, if they're here, if, if they've done that. Have, we, we don't have them on the list to speak on this bill, only um, only um, uh, director of uh, coordinator of elections Goins is on the list if needed. Thank you. Representative Lamar. I'm not, I can't answer that question, but they've asked me to pass this law so they can't have it. So I'm also a representative who can make something happen for them. So they have asked me to do it, and that's why I'm here presenting in front of you, asking you to pass this bill to allow them to have those opportunities on campus. Uh, Representative Shaw. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I, I, uh, I've been listening to the discussion. I guess my question at this point, even if it's not codified, am I hearing that any university could do it if they want to, that it's not against the law if they, say, if the University of Memphis, whoever, want to do this? I, I get your passion, and I understand that. And I, I appreciate very much what you're doing. I, I wouldn't have any problem voting for your legislation. Don't get me wrong, but I guess my question I want to understand is, can universities, both private and public, do this now? Is, um, would, that, would they be breaking any law if they wanted to do this? If Lane College in Jackson want to do this, are they breaking the law? You asked to me or I'm asking Lamar? whomever can answer that question. Uh, right now, it is totally permissive that a university and a county election commission can jointly agree to do this, whether it be one day or a permanent precinct. And um, this would not be really codifying. It would be codifying a position on certain locations, but by passing it, it would be mandating that everyone would have to abide by it. Okay. 
that that yeah. is the answer to my question. However, I have no problem with your legislation. I just want to understand that because I want to go back and tell my folks they need to do that. Uh, any other uh, any other questions? If not, we got Representative uh, Lamar. Any comments, closing comments? Absolutely. I just uh, hope that you all voted in support of this bill because of what it could do for students, what it could do for our electric, what it can do for democracy, and it will truly bring more opportunities for our younger generation who can vote, exercise their constitutional right to engage in the voting process. And so I ask for your support. Thank you. Seeing uh, no more questions, are you um, ready to vote on the bill? Seeing no objections, uh, all those in favor of, I believe, what this is, H 1869, uh, say aye. Aye. Opposed, nay. No. Uh, the bill fails uh, for lack of a majority. Uh, next on the uh, is item number 10, HB 2386 by Representative Lamar. Motion. I have a motion and second. I believe there are no amendments to this bill, are there? No, it's okay. no amendment of the bill. Please tell us about your bill. Thank you. It changes from 30 days to 15 days, the length of time prior to an election, which a qualified voter may register to vote. So instead of doing 30 days, it's 15 days. And it requires the Division of Elections to develop a system to enable people to verify the status of their voter registration application in time as denoted by a timeline. And it requires the division to make such system available to each county election commission to maintain the individual websites. So in other words, what that means is that one, we'll change the voter registration timeline from 30 days to 15 days. 15 days is an adequate enough time to register folks to vote and get them in the system. And then secondly, we're asking to create a system of transparency when you do register to vote, this system is supposed to tell you where your application is in the registration process. So a lot of times you'll see your application in, you don't know if it's processed yet, is it registered, is it done, when you, especially when you do it online. So if you can go online and see what the status of your voter registration form is, it will make it easier and more transparent for people to know what is going on with their voter registration. Is it active, is it not active? Uh, any other changes, they can see where it is in that process. And so what we're trying to do is modernize the system, um, but also cut down on such a, a long um, period that you have to wait, you have to reg uh, register to vote before you can participate in the election. And I do believe I have uh, someone here to testify, uh, Chairman. Yes, we have uh, two uh, two people that are uh, asked to testify if needed. I think first up is uh, Miss was it Kendra Lee? Yes, I believe is that a Memphis uh, election commissioner? Shelby County election commissioner. Okay. We'll uh, with any objections, we'll go out of session to hear testimony. No objections. We are out of session. Be sure and uh, Miss Lee, be sure and uh, press your uh, speak button. Make sure it's red. Oh, this is new for me, sorry. Uh, please um, identify yourself. Yes, uh, Kendra Lee with the Shelby County Election Commission. I was appointed in April of 2021, and one of the immediate conversations that we started to have is to really figure out how we could create a lot of efficiency. Uh, we were doing things well, but we knew that things could be done better. Um, so one of the conversations that we initially started was talking about reducing the number of days for the deadline from 30 days to 15 days. And so in our most recent election commission meeting, I asked Linda Phillips, I was like, well, why exactly is the deadline 30 days? And she said, because it's a state law. Um, and so when I further inquired about would there be any pushback for us to be able to shorten it, She's like, why don't you go up to Nashville and see what they say? Um, so I am taking quite literal instructions on being able to ask that. And I think that as we move into this new era of innovation um, in the way that we do things, uh, we have tons of people that are utilizing um, online voter registration. And when we talk about the actual capacity that it takes to register those voters, we are doing it in such a quicker and more efficient way now that we can be able to allow 
allow our voters or our potential voters to have enough time uh, from that 30 day deadline to 15 days. Um, and furthermore, we know that you guys did very hard work uh, with our redistricting process. And a lot of people's districts are going to change from their state house to their state senate, to their county commissions, to their school boards. And we know it's gonna be a huge overhaul for a voter education campaign. But what we want to be able to do is to provide more time for individuals to do the research, to feel comfortable getting familiar with their new districts and their new legislators if they need to. Um, and of course, allowing that to really be able to hone in on the way that we are doing things here um, in the state and in the city. And so when I brought the concept up to Linda Phillips, there was no pushback or disagreement with it. Um, she simply said that if it's something that we want to be able to explore, that we should be able to ask of this from our state legislators. All right, um, I see you have any uh, questions. Seeing, uh, seeing none, uh, thank you for your testimony. Thank you, I appreciate it. Uh, next up is uh, Coordinator of Elections, uh, Mark Goins. Mark Goins, Coordinator of Elections. Um, I'm here in the capacity representing the Secretary of State's office. I am not aware of the Shelby County Election Commission taking a stance on this piece of legislation. So I don't know if the prior commissioner is, here's an individual or on behalf of the commission. But what I can tell you in some of the, in talking, I'm sorry I'm out of breath. As you know, I've been a little under weather, but um, um, I'm getting back on track. Anyway, um, what I can share with you, some of the folks that I've talked to in the election community, election administrators, uh, they are concerned um, with a, 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 what we'd call a dump of forms at the deadline. Currently, we have 10 days to register folks to register to vote when they turn these forms in before early voting starts. And what this bill would do, this bill would say during early voting, you could still come in and register to vote. And as you recall, a few years ago, Right before the deadline, we had thousands of forms that were deposited uh, or brought in uh, right at the deadline. And some of those forms had uh, dates, you know, a month, a month and a half before that. Well, when you get all those forms, uh, it's very difficult to go through and verify the information on there because particularly during early voting, because during that time frame, what will happen is these folks that will be coming in or someone may have brought their form in, they will also be showing up to vote at an early voting site. I'll give you an example in Shelby County. Shelby County has consistently expanded early voting sites. Now they have 22 in a presidential election site. Well, the fact that someone may have registered to vote in one area at the election commission office, that doesn't mean they're gonna show up at that early voting site. So that's a situation where we're not gonna be able to, to check that voter registration if that, process ha if that form hasn't been processed. As an example, a few years ago, we had to, because of that, what I call a dump of, of all these forms, and some of them just had an initial, had nothing else on them. We had to, you know, we were begging people to come in to help process these forms at the last moment. But this bill does more. This bill also requires um, the Division of Elections and Election Commissions to go out and start recruiting poll watchers. Well, poll watchers is typically folks that's looking at the process. You know, they're looking, overlooking us. And so I can see a conflict with us going out and trying to recruit poll watchers. But frankly, uh, if we're out there and about, we, we don't need to be recruiting poll watchers. We need to be recruiting poll officials because we have a shortage in many areas dealing with poll officials. But this bill would, would require us to also go out and recruit poll watchers, which I think is a conflict, number one, because really poll watchers are third party organizations that come in to make sure we're doing our job correctly. But the other thing is, it, you know, if, if we're out there recruiting, we don't need to be taking our resources to, to recruit poll watchers. We need to be taking our resources out there to, to get poll officials. And then another thing as far as the voter lookup, we have a voter lookup currently. It is not in real time. And, and one of the reasons it's not in real time, there's some security measures that we take. And, and there's multiple processes that we put in place to protect voters' information. 
if, if this bill were to pass, it would, it would require the counties to require, I mean, to have this online tool that we, you know, like I say, we currently have it, there is a delay, but it would require them to do that in real time. The way that it works now is when someone comes in to register to vote, the, it's all generated from the county. Uh, we get that information overnight. They're sent to us all at one time. This, because it says real time, this, this is a game changer and could, uh, not only is there a significant cost to it, but it also could open up uh, some security issues for us as far as protecting uh, voter data. The way that we do it now, it's, it's a laid out process that we've worked with STS, and if y'all are familiar with STS, that's, that's actually the folks that's over on the governor's administration. Our IT folks work with them, and we've, we've developed this process to keep uh, the information safe. So it's not that we don't have a voter lookup, we have that. Uh, but it's a situation that's not in real time. Uh, but it is updated, particularly in elections. We, we update that voter lookup regularly. Uh, and, and as we get closer to early voting, it's a daily thing that we're updating it. Thank you. Uh, we uh, have a question from Chairman Hoskall. Thank you, Chairman. What would you say your average time is like when you get a card to load it in and time you can get a response back to know you're a registered voter? Well, so it depends. If, if it's... Um, you know, when we, so we've had days online, so this is the other thing about the convenience of voting, we've had days we've had 100,000 people uh, register statewide, and that's either, they're either updating their their um, transaction, changing their address, or they're, they're registering to vote. But when that comes in, obviously that can create a backlog, but what we do, we try to have like a voter registration day, or we try to coordinate it, and we try to do that far out in advance. So it really depends on how many forms are coming in at that time. Typically it's, it's um, even when, even in those, um, even in those days where we are, we are, we are getting a lot of transactions like that, we we tell our counties if they can ten days or less. Uh, in a non-election year, I mean, it can happen that day. You know, the form comes in. But as far as their voter lookup, like I say, there's always going to be a day delay because everything's at the county level, and then it, it transfers to us. But the reason it takes a little while to verify the card, number one, you. you you know, you're looking at the voter registration form, making sure the, the information's accurate, and there's some, some checks that we make, that we do to make sure that the person's eligible. So it's not just like, I'm looking at a form, it looks good, let's put them in the system. It's, I'm looking at the form, I'm making sure that they're not an ineligible felon and, and some of those other things. Chairman Hoskall? All right, any other questions? Seeing none, thank you, Mr. Goins. Um, we are coming back into session. Uh, any other questions on the bill? If not, uh, if not, uh, Representative Lamar, closing. Thank you. Um, again, we have issues, no conversations ever been had with me about it. Um, but in regards to transparency, there are states around this country that do same day voter registration. It's able to process it. There are systems that allow exactly what I'm doing. We just got to implement those. We have the capacity as citizens, you have the right to register to vote whenever up until the deadline, whether it's the day of the day, we are supposed to have the capacity to do that. And again, what this system does is modernizing our voter registration process. Again, he has said our system is outdated, it is late, it is not real time. There are systems out there that we can gladly adopt that will continue to keep our security safe and also give voters more transparency. As far as the poll watcher, I just don't think it's a good look for us as a state to say that we don't want to recruit people to help keep us accountable and transparent. That's what this, this is what it does and that's why we have poll watchers and have poll workers do all of these things. And cutting down on the 30 days will one, give us more time to let people know an election is coming up and give them the opportunity to participate again. There are states that are already doing this around the country. It's not impossible. There is a playbook in place. We just got to decide as a state if we want to allow people to engage in the process more fairly, better, more transparency. And that's what this bill allows us to do. Thank you. Any, uh, any other questions? Seeing none, is there any objections to voting on the bill? Seeing none, we will be voting on HB 2386 by Representative Marr. All those in favor, say aye. Aye. Opposed, nay. No. Nays, uh, nays carry. Uh, the bill fails. Next uh, is item number 13, HB 2764 by Vice Chairman Wright. 
Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Is it permissive that I sit at my desk and yes, present? Sir. Uh, oh, do I have a motion and a second? A motion and a second. Uh, you may proceed. Uh, all those, uh, let's see. Well, here, let's tell us about your bill. We have yeah. a motion and second on the bill. We, we have a motion and a second on the bill. Please proceed. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, the bill as it is currently before you is incomplete. Um, being as this is the election commission committee, election committee, uh, I would like a little bit of discussion of the bill uh, in that it is currently saying three voting cycles and because this passed, because this, I'm, no, go ahead. Okay. Because this uh, no last. question on your bill. I'm sorry. No. Question no. on something else. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Because uh, this past Monday was a holiday, I did not get my bill amended timely uh, getting into Tuesday. I would like to amend the bill after discussion next week that a person is not eligible to qualify as a candidate for United States Senate or a member of the United States House of Representatives unless the person has been a resident of the state for three years prior to the date of the election in which the person seeks to qualify as a candidate. Now, I know I read that rather quickly, but you see the intent is to move from voting in the previous three elections to being a resident of the state of Tennessee for three years. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to see if any of the, my fellow members have comment on that. I, uh, Representative Shaw. I just want to commend the chairman for this. I, matter of fact, I'm really behind. I thought this was probably already in law. I thank you for that. I don't think we'd want anybody representing us at state or federal level that come in one day and run for an office the next day. You know, I, I, I appreciate this, and hopefully we get it in some kind of order so we, we can pass it, because I think that's that's very critical. Uh, Chairman Hosclaw. Just, just for my clarification, thank you, Chairman, just for my clarification, you said they have to live in. This, did they have to live in the district they're in too? As I read what I would. Go ahead, go ahead Chairman. Right. As I would uh, refer to what I have just read, uh, it would be that the person would be a resident of the state for three years, whether it be for Senate or House of Representatives. My question again, though, is: Is once they run, do they have to be in that district? I think not just in the state of Tennessee. I Chairman Wright. I would assume that, and I'm making an assumption right now. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. That that the uh, person would have to reside in the district after elected. Second. Chairman Williams. Um, the uh, I. I it's my understanding, do we, as it relates to elections for our offices, state, state offices, not federal offices, as it relates to those, how do we measure time as it relates to that? I mean, to me, I thought it was a, a period of time, like a year, not a number of election cycles. But I guess the question is, is why would we, why would we veer from that model or method? Vice Chairman Wright. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I agree with you in that um, the methods for our qualification to, to campaign to be elected to the position we're in and the requirement to be elected to these positions that are being designated should be the same. Chairman Williams. Then my suggestion is, is we get with research to find out what, so that they're the same. What, whatever it is, it should be the same. And much like us, I think it shouldn't be, I think they should reside in that, in that congressional district for the length of time necessary to qualify. So 
Um, it, it, I think it's my understanding there's a possibility that you could run for the current statute says you could run, and Mr. Gomez is here, that you could run for a congressional seat of which you don't reside in. Yeah. And, and while we're fixing, that, in my opinion, would be a, another good fix. Vice Chairman Wright. And thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> and I agree with you. I agree. I will. And that is the reason for my discussion today is to find the uh, suggestions that uh, that my fellow committee members would find agreeable in passing this legislation. If if there be no other questions about this three years of the, the three year. Uh, Chairman, I, not so much a question, I think, to answer yours, I think and maybe legal or, or uh, even um, Director Goins could correct me, I believe that one of the issues here is that every state office and even the presidency has requirements, but it's very limited what the federal government has put in place for Congress. And the question is whether we can go beyond the limits that the Constitution has set for houses of Senate. So I don't know what the uh, federal definition is. They very it's only like three or four items they've said you have to be. And um, I think that's the question everybody's got till someone goes beyond the limits they've set, can we? And then the other question earlier, I believe it's not, it, not in your proposed amendment, is that we're limited what we can do to tell political parties what to do in their nominating process. But I believe that's not in your amendment. But, but uh, I know that's what one thing, and I guess um, um, legal could answer your question what the federal government currently says is the requirements for local office, if you want legal to answer that. <clears throat> he, um, if he has that information, it's fine. I think for the purposes of the chairman uh, in trying to draft, draft an amendment that rewrites his bill, the purpose was really to make sure that there was some form of consistency between federal and state elections so that qualifications were identical. Yeah. We, uh, the the uh, legal, I don't think we're going to go out of session, but legal can read the current qualifications that's in federal law. Well, what's what the current binding um, qualifications are for Congress? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Josh Houston, Legal Services. Uh, the U.S. Constitution in uh, Article One, Section Two, uh, says that no person shall be a representative who shall not have attained the age of twenty-five years and been seven years a citizen of the United States, and who shall not, when elected, been be an inhabitant of that state in which he shall be chosen. And the Supreme Court has has uh, held that. That, that part about him being an inhabitant of that state in which he shall be chosen is on the day of the election. So anytime prior to that, there's no requirement that you live in that state. Okay. Uh, Chairman Williams. Then uh, in our state constitution then, uh, is, it, is it mute or similar language as it relates to those qualifications for state office? Thank you, Chairman. Uh, the, in the Tennessee Constitution, in Article 2, Section 9, says that no person shall be a representative unless he shall be a citizen of the United States of the age of 21 years and shall have been a citizen of this state for three years and a resident in the county he represents for one year immediately preceding the election. Chairman Williams. So um, the Tennessee Constitution is by far more clear about what those requirements are. I guess the question that I would have for legal is, do you believe we have the constitutional authority since states manage elections to modify the state statute to have the residency requirements which match those of state offices? Let me, uh, since we're opening up to beyond the first question, I'm gonna, to keep in um, uh, normal, follow normal procedure, I'm gonna go out of session to uh, so legal can answer questions. Okay. We're out of session. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Josh Houston, Legal Services. Uh, so to answer your question, the, I believe it would be constitutionally suspect to add additional qualifications for uh, members of the U.S. Congress. Um, it has been a, tried in the past. Uh, the Supreme Court um, declared an, a, an amendment to the Arkansas Constitution that created uh, term limits for their representatives in Congress. Uh, they, they declared that unconstitutional because the Constitution lays out what the qualifications are for the uh, U.S. 
House and Senate, and in their opinion, there were could not be any additional qualifications added by states. Chairman Williams, was there? And I know you didn't read the the, the entire report, but was there any consideration as it related to? Uh, the role that states play in administering elections as it relates to those qualifications? or I've, It just seems ironic to me that the federal government saw in its great wisdom to have states manage elections and then turn around and let them not manage elections. Uh, legal. You may not be a constitutional scholar. You may be just a... I'm not, I'm not sure that there was any discussion about whether or not States should be able to do that. I know that in that in that Arkansas case, there was a, a dissent filed. So I was I'm, I assume in that that there was some um, some thoughts towards that. But okay, thank you. And I I, I don't know the exact wording, but uh, correct me if I'm wrong. I believe the the Constitution of the law states that um, local uh, elections shall be regulated or run by. Uh, state governments, unless otherwise stated by Congress, uh, they everybody forgets that last line. But um, I forgot exactly how it's phrased. But they gave themselves an out. But um, any other questions of legal, uh, Representative Shaw? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So in that case, would we be within the Constitution to pass Chairman's bill to make it three years to be a citizen of the state? For three years, for Congress, I'm talking about. It's clear what we've got on the on the state level, but on the federal level, are we going to be within the Constitution then to pass a law that says they have to live in in the state for three years and and uh, to represent us on the federal level? I guess that's that's my question. I, that would be, I guess, the legal. Legal. Yeah. Representative Shaw, like I said before, uh, uh, the passage of this bill would be constitutionally suspect. Say that again. I'm sorry. This would, if we were to pass this this law, it would be constitutionally suspect. It would be it would be ripe for a constitutional challenge. Okay. All right. Uh, Chairman Williams. I had a an old majority leader who's now a grandpa that told me when I first got elected here uh, that. With the majority, you can move the capital out of Nashville if you want to. But, and so our job is not necessarily to wade the fine line of constitutional suspicion, but it is to do what we feel is in the best interest of the, of the citizens of Tennessee and let the courts opine if, it, if, we, if we're wrong. And I think that's what happened in Arkansas. I don't, I don't, think, we should, I don't think we should retreat without brandishing a sword if this is what the body wanted to do. Thank you. Uh, the uh, uh, Tennessee Republican Party Chairman Scott Golden is here, and since we're out of recess uh, asking questions, if you free, feel free to comment on Representative Wright's bill. And um, you had to step out for a meeting, I believe, but the um, you have three minutes, and you can either be seated or at the podium, whichever you're comfortable with. Whatever. Just uh, press your button. Make sure the red light's on. Um, we have been discussing. He is proposing rolling the... Um, the bill, and he's taking advice on any amendments that he's proposed uh, for, for uh, I guess you're going to roll it for a week, but, um, um, and uh, your name and position for the record and any, any comments you have, and we can open it up for questions as well. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, Rudd, uh, Scott Golden, Chairman of the Tennessee Republican Party. Thanks to all the members. Thanks for your time. I especially want to thank my oldest and dearest friend on this panel, which is Representative Johnny Shaw, by the way. We go back a long way in Madison County. So, uh, uh, but thank you all for your work on this. Thank you for today's, all that you're trying to do for, uh, to help our elections. We absolutely appreciate it. In terms of Representative Wright's bill, and we, I know we've spoken before that, you know, this is a residency requirements are a province of the legislature. And the, the bill that was passed earlier that I know that, that representative, I mean, that uh, Mark and I were talking about last night, some of the issues that we've, as we found, that have popped up. And I appreciate you guys trying to think through the best way to get our candidates, you know, make sure that they are who they say they are, they live where they say they live, and that they are eligible to run for the office that they'd like to run to, run for. So I am 
really appreciate that you guys are taking up this issue. We are absolutely in favor of residency requirements. Uh, we have them for most of the office and certainly for the ones that are, that are for, for most of the offices that are on the ballot for April, uh, uh, the filing deadlines in April, but, and, and you know, with this legislation today, hopefully some that come back in May. So you guys, uh, I am here to assist in any way possible uh, with this legislation, 100% in favor of residency requirements, any desires that you guys have to solve this issue. Uh, where it gets a little bit tricky, of course, is with the bylaws of the Tennessee Republican Party. I know that we have uh, uh, have a lot of nuance, and they certainly get changed, and we have a lot of members. I know one of our, our members, um, uh, Michelle Foreman, is here today. Uh, they get changed about on a triannual basis, and <laughs> about every three months they go undergo, and we're certainly willing to kind of work to accommodate some of these issues if we can on our end, and if, uh, if there is a desire to the committee, uh, we would be happy to take that up. So with that being said, I appreciate what you do and look forward to answering any questions. Have any questions to um, Chairman Golden? Oh, Chairman Williams. Thank you, Chairman Golden, for being here. One of the discussions that we had is that the, the uh, constitutional suspicion of whether or not we can or can't do this. I guess my question to you would be, are you aware of any other states uh, uh, through your relationships with other county executive or executive committees that, that, that require residency that the states have adopted those? I, I'm aware of the desire to do it, but I'm not aware of any that actually with their legislature has taken it up. And, and believe me, with the way we, we do elections very well in Tennessee, I can tell you in talking with some of my colleagues around the country that not all of them go as well as they are in Tennessee. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm aware that there has been efforts, but I'm not sure of the success that's been passed to the legislature. Thank you. Any other uh, uh, representative, Shaw? And, and thank you, Mr. Golden, for our long-lasting relationship. Thank you. I, and, I, and I heard what Chairman Williams said about moving the capital, if the body agree. I'm, I'm aware of that. I, I do understand that. But I'm wondering what parse does it put us in when it – and we, we often talk here about the Consti – the Constitution is a good document when we want to do something, but when we don't want to – do something, it's a bad document. I also get that too here, so I, I'm, I'm aware of all of that, but you've been to Washington, actually. You've served there with, uh, and so what do you think the repercussions of the Congress, the federal Congress, is going to be if we change the law? Uh, because you're right, we've got, and I wonder sometimes why we're passing all this legislation in Tennessee, because we're leading right now. It seems like we want to be bad, because we're the best state in the United States in terms of having elections, but we keep on passing bills that finally going to make us the worst, I think. <laughs> but, however, that's another story. But what do you think, from the view of Congress, this is going to be? Well, I, I think there is, uh, at, at least in the members and uh, the ones that I can speak for in Tennessee, that there is a desire that the state is empowered to govern elections uh, with the Tenth Amendment of the Constitution. Now, in terms of what goes into those elections, you know, there, I mean, obviously there are some stipulations in the Constitution, but fundamentally, the, the, at least on our side of the aisle in Congress, the desire is for the states to make the laws that people are elected by. And, and I, you know, as with most things, I think they're going to have to be adjudicated by a court of law. And we'll see what, uh, what, what might be come out of that that ultimately makes a decision. Mm -hmm. Representative uh, I guess my final question, and you mentioned the Republican Party bylaws. How do you think the party itself is going to adjust to this, do you think the party will fall in line with this idea as well? Well, we will do whatever the state legislature tells okay. us to do. I say it all the time that, and Michelle can attest that I say state law trumps party law any day of the week. So we play by the rules that you guys set, and we work within that framework uh, as best we can. And but there are some instances, perhaps, where as a private entity um, that we would have to make sure that that our rights are protected and uh, and making sure that 
you know, we, we still have the ability to govern the, our process the way that we need to do it as our body. That is also elected, by the way, on and across the state of Tennessee. Representative Shaw. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And just briefly, I just don't want to see the chairman's legislation get totally chopped up because I think he has a great idea. And uh, uh, whatever is the right thing to do, uh, I think I'd just like to see his legislation get a fair share. That's all. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, chairman, um, I, not, not just on this legislation as originally I think came out of the Senate or was being proposed, which I believe your amendment takes care of that, but as I've harped in this committee time and time again on different pieces of legislation, usually uh, nowhere near the ramifications of this, is that we, it is our job to regulate the election laws uh, within federal guidelines and the Supreme Court rulings. But as there's been multiple Supreme Court rulings, we are limited in what we can tell a private organization like the Republican Party what to do. Mm -hmm. It's one thing to set residency requirements. It's another thing to interfere with your nominating process. The Supreme Court has time and time again struck that down, that that is your private process, how you nominate your nominees. And um, we have limited flexibility there. And that's one thing I've objected to and um, didn't want to have to go to court on a variety of different issues and bills um, because if we start down a path of telling political parties themselves how to how to have their bona fide status and how to choose their nominees we're going to start putting term limits on party chairs and uh, defining uh, defining you, the rules the of the state executive committee and that that's going to be struck down in court too so i appreciate you being here and answering that but is there any other questions of uh, of chairman golden Seeing none, we'll go back into session. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. We are back in session. And uh, Vice Chairman Wright, back to you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I appreciate the comments of uh, Representative Williams as it relates to the, the situation we find ourselves in, in this one portion of changing three elections into three years. And Mr. Chairman, I apologize that I should have said I had three subjects. So. I don't want the next two to take up as much as the first one. We uh, we have the room for 15 more minutes, and we have one more bill. Uh, the so after you, the other two points, Mr. Chairman, that I had that I would like to have uh, committee consideration on is that we are approximately two to three weeks into petition pickup and preparing for the next general election, and if and when any legislation was to take effect, I believe it is casting a cloud toward the next general election so that as a part of the amendment, that I, the bill amended that I will uh, bring at a future date, the effective date of what I propose will be the day after the next general election. And I'd like to hear conversation or, or comment from the committee. Our Chairman Williams. Well, the same guy that told me that with a simple majority you can move the capital to Nashville also says if it's good enough to do, we should do it. Um, and so, if if it's something we, if it's something that the body feels necessary to do, and and if someone, for instance, if someone moved here in January or, or December they technically wouldn't qualify two and a half years from now uh, based upon if their residency requirements were the same. So does that mean if somebody was elected to Congress and, and then the next time they came to qualify, they technically wouldn't qualify? Uh, Vice Chairman uh, Wright. Yes. Uh, thank you uh, again, Chairman Williams. Uh, that is my third point. The... Um, bill as proposed would have no effect on incumbents. So uh, discussion of anything as relates to the three points that I was asking as relates to how I might present an amended bill. Any other questions or comments? If not, back to you, um, Vice Chairman Wright. Uh, uh, Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I propose or move to roll my bill one week. 
Are there any objections to rolling the bill one week? HB 2764. Seeing none, it is rolled one week. Uh, I will um, pass the gavel and the, com and the command back over to Chairman Crawford so I can present a bill. Oh. We, House Bill 0499, we do have a proper motion in second. Representative Rudd, you're recognized on, well, it looks like we've got an amendment. Can you give me your drafting code? It is 13154. That is correct. Motion. Got a proper motion. Second. second on the amendment. Chairman Rudd, you're recognized on the amendment. Thank you. This is a very, very simple. It is not changing any existing law or code. It is simply stating that right now it is currently against state law in Code 271111C, uh, 115B, uh, and punishable by a Class C misdemeanor, that if you knowingly cross over to the other party's primary to participate with no intentions of returning to your own primary without meeting a bona fide status, it's against the law. And uh, a perfect example of this is in another county just this past week, um, which has been turned over to a DA. I'm not getting into where. I got, we, had, uh, we had elected officials from one party asking people to cross over and vote in, uh, matter of fact, in a Republican primary to unseat two executive committee people on the ballot to try to get Democrats to participate and, and emails and Facebook posts. And uh, that is illegal. All this bill does, it does not change state law, it simply states that each um, election precinct, when people are checking in to vote, that on a eight and a half by 11 sheet of paper, yellow background, that this law, uh, which is stated in the amendment, it's law, please read, and it just states it's posted there so they can read it and know that they could be breaking the law if they do this. And that's all the bill does, it just posts a notice. With that, I'm open to Thank any questions. Thank you for your explanation of the event amended bill. We do have a proper motion and second on the amendment. Is there any questions for the sponsor on the I amendment? Shaw. Representative Shaw, you're recognized. Thank you. Uh, just for clarification, so there's an election going on in my county, and I wanted to cross over and vote Republican. I'd be breaking the law. Chairman uh, Rudd, you're recognized? No, not necessarily. The states, if you don't have an intention on, uh, and legal can correct me, but uh, I think the law is written that if you cross over with no intention of returning, uh, with intention of returning to your own, if you're only doing it to, and you don't meet bona fide status just to affect the outcome of that other person's primary, that's broken the law. If you're going to return, if you're going to stay in that party and you sign an oath or you, you switch parties, uh, you're not breaking the law. But, uh, so technically, I guess, if you cross this time and there was no paper trail of why you're doing it and then you didn't return the, and you return to your own party the next time, you'd be breaking the law. Follow up? Yes, sir. Uh, so I, I, what I'm trying to get, so in a primary, if I wanted to vote for someone in a primary, I'd have to sign to say that I'm going to stay with that party in the general election as well. Is that basically what, what this bill is doing? Chairman Rudd. Uh, again, the bill does not do that. It doesn't change all. That's already state law. This is simply posting a notice of what the state law is. Follow and, up. And you're, it's, a, it's, against, uh, it's currently against state law and has been for a long time. It's not always enforced uh, that you're not allowed to vote in the other person's primary, that you don't meet the bona fide status. And if you're going to switch parties, you're supposed to sign, so you're within the law, a, um, that what you, is it, an oath of... Yeah, that you are switching yeah. parties. Okay, thank you. Chairman Williams, you're recognized for a question. Uh, just a response to uh, Representative Shaw. The, the water's warm, sir. If you come over, you can stay. You don't have to go back. <laughs> Out of order. Um, any other questions for the sponsor? We're on the amendment. Seeing none, we're ready to vote on the amendment. The amendment number is 013154. All in favor, say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. The amendment passes. It's on Bill House. Number 0499.
Question has been called on the bill as amended. All those in favor of the bill say aye. aye. Those opposed, no. Bill moves on to the next committee. This time I'll turn the gavel back to the chairman. I guess the, uh, the thing that I've been most impressed with is uh, our legal right now, uh, Josh, managed to pick up this um, a board and the gavel with one hand. That's impressive. <laughs> um, well, um, is there any further business or announcements on the committee? That was our last bill for this week. Seeing none, uh, with no objections, we are hereby adjourned.